Okay, um, thank you all. I hope you all had a, a good lunch. Um, I'm chairing the first session this afternoon. Um, I, my name's Helen, for those of you that haven't met me before. Um, and this afternoon's session, um, before break, we're just going to be talking about um, the way that TDP and other projects have been um, enabling more people to get involved in archaeology um, on ver various different groups of people. Um, some of it's work that we've done at TDP, and then um, one of our frog volunteers is going to be talking about the Enabled Archaeology Foundation that she has founded herself, which is exciting. I'm really pleased that she can be here today. Um, so yeah, I thought um, I'd start off by talking about our Engaging Older Londoners project. So for those of you that don't know, um, this is a project that we've been running since February 2016. So that's two and, two and a half, a bit more than two and a half years now. Um, it's funded by an organisation called the City Bridge Trust. Uh, they're a grant funder who, um, and their money basically comes because they own most of the bridges in London and have done for a, a long time. Um, and they fund projects that aim to engage with very, um, very hard to reach groups in London. Um, and one of those groups that they've targeted as being particularly at risk of social isolation and would benefit from um, increased funding are Londoners who are aged over 75. Um, if you are based in London, you'll know it's quite a relatively young city compared to the rest of the country. Um, there are older people living in London, and um, that's fantastic, but you can sometimes get marginalised, particularly once you're over 75. Um, that is the point of where it drops off. People's social activities and physical activity quite often drops off over 75, which is why the City Bridge Trust focus on those. Um, our project was scheduled to run until February 2019, um, but what's happened is, we, you probably, as Elliot mentioned, we've had a little bit of a restructure of the team um, since Nat left, and Will is going to join us at the end of this month, and he's going to pick the project up. So it's been on hiatus over the summer, um, but it will start picking up again when Will starts in at the end of October. Um, so expect to see more Older London stuff, which means it will carry on for a bit longer as well, so some time, so it'll carry on past February 2019 until probably about this time next year which is also great news. Um, so I'll just do a little bit of a talk about some of the things that we've been doing with this funding. We've been doing lots and lots of workshops and talks, um, and some of that is just making sure that the activities that we're doing, and um, public activities like these ones, are as accessible as possible for the older people, um, but also going out to groups where um, of older people across London. I've been everywhere, from Richmond to Havering, I am very familiar with the um, London Transport Network now. Um, so this is uh, the North London University of the Third Age Group, who are, I think, becoming a little bit um, fans of us because they keep asking me to go back and do stuff with them, which is brilliant. Um, they're all very enthusiastic about um, Thames archaeology, as some of the grins in this picture show you. Um, so um, yeah, we go out and give talks, workshops, handling sessions. Um, we're taking people out. On, along the river, we do foreshore walks. Um, I think that's actually the North London U3A group again on a foreshore walk. Um, but we also do riverside strolls um, for groups. So for people who would struggle to get down onto the foreshore for whatever reason, um, or would struggle to do a longer walk, we do short walks um, along the Thames path. So we don't go down onto the foreshore, we just stay on the path. And we've, we've, got, we've identified sites where it's a level access as much as possible, um, maybe with some ramps. Um, do a short 15, 20 minute walk where you can view the archaeology from the Thames path and you get a good view of it. And then we'll go to a local cafe and we'll get out some artifacts and we'll do a little bit of a handling session. Um, and they've been really popular as well. So I'm hoping we'll be doing more of those next year as well. Um, yeah, and we've been doing handling sessions with all sorts of different groups. And this has been one of the things that has really taken me by surprise by this project. Um, we've been visiting um, groups of social clubs. This is... Um, uh, last month, Josh and I went to South London Cares, which is a um, buddying um, charity which aims to bring together neighbours from different generations and doing activities together. Um, and we spent an afternoon with them talking about what we do at Thames Discovery and looking at all of our artefacts and hearing people's stories and memories of living alongside the Thames. Um, these sessions always trigger people to start reminiscing, which is really lovely, about all sorts of stuff, not necessarily about archaeology. And you get all sorts of interesting conversations going on. 
Um, and they've also gone down really well with dementia groups because they're a very tactile session. So for people who were maybe having cognitive problems or um, uh, finding um, sight problems and things like that, being able to handle stuff is, is a way of still being able to engage in it. Especially when you get like a, an artifact or a pottery where you've got like a fingerprint or something like that, that really seems to resonate with people. And we've been going into care homes as well, residential care homes, and, and doing the same session there, um, which has been fantastic. Um, we've also been, um, for the people who are able, we've been encouraging them to take part in frog training. Um, this is Jane, who's in the room. Um, and we've got some lovely accounts by some of our volunteers which I will share with you later about their experiences about volunteering with us. Um, and we've also been doing an oral history project. And this has really started to take off this year. Um, we've been interviewing people who have been visiting the foreshore for all sorts of reasons for more than 20 years. Um, whether that's because they've, they've worked on the river, they were a boat builder or waterman, um, whether it's because they've been down there for recreation, um, Maybe they were a fisherman or a rower, um, foreshore archaeologists, riverfront archaeologists. We've got an interview lined up very soon with somebody who um, volunteered alongside Gus on the Trig Lane excavations in the 1970s. If any of you um, worked on any of the um, waterfront excavations in the 70s or earlier, we'd love to hear from you. Um, and if you were visiting the foreshore um, from like before the 1990s, we would love to, to talk to you about, about your memories and your experiences. I've got some flyers on our desk about the Oral History Project. Um, and we've got a few, we've also got, we've talked to people who um, used to visit Tower Beach um, as a child when it was a pleasure beach as well. Um, so I've got, if the um, interview, if the sound works, that's fingers crossed. Um, so the, I've just got a few clips from some of the interviews we've done recently. This is... Um, from an interview of a lady called Elizabeth Wood, who um, grew up um, alongside the river in various places around West London, has always lived near the river in London, and visited the foreshore a lot. And she was interviewed by Graham last year. So, fingers crossed. We used to go down onto the foreshore as well, and, uh, because my friend lived near Small Prophet's Dock, which was one of the docks along the river in Barnes. And uh, I have an amazing piece of... of uh, memorabilia that I picked off the, the riverbed and I've always been baffled by it because it looked like some sort of rather nice archaeological <laughs> specimen and much later on I was to do the same thing, this was before you had to have mudlarkers license and so on um, over a, near Eagle Pie Island um, where you found old bottles and things which I think was a, a memory from the days when uh, Eel Pie Island had the hotel on it, so you're finding local manufactured bottles. And again, as I say, we, we used to, when, I, when I was first married, we lived in Pimlico, and somewhere I got a terrible photograph of me in the mud along the foreshore there, just, just enjoy walking along the river bed. Um, and then the second interview was with a, a lady called Pat Wilson, who um, worked in Vauxhall and watched the um, riverfront excavations underneath the MI6 building. Now, I've, I know there are people in the room who may be able to answer this question. She thought they found a boat and she organised for people from her office to go and visit the excavations. We're not sure if they did find a boat under the MI6 building, so if anyone can tell me what she was looking at, I would be <laughs> really interested. But I, I will play you her memory. digging and everything, and we just got so interested in it. Um, she caught some of the chaps as well. So, as I say, I asked the chap, and uh, I went back to the office and said, he said, you can't go down the mountains, you've got to spread it out, and then a couple of days or so, and they go down the mountains. And that was it, and he was telling us all about that, all about the boat, which I can't remember so much of that. But there, that, that was really quite a great deal. Why to so you can from the the river. Yeah, that was really near the river. So you can see there how far that is, you know, that is coming, the river and all that is coming. Yeah. yeah. There's other little pieces there as well. And uh, we said, oh, you're going to take it out. And so they're not allowed to. So we've got, we've got a deadline. Is that fine? They have a deadline to do it. 
have a whole photograph and then they have them um, yeah. putting a muscle which you see and they said they're going to use it. But it, it was really fascinating. And how often did, then, you, did you see it? Well, we saw it every, every day when they were doing it. When they were excavating. We were watching during your break. Well, I need to really. Because it's very long, such a long window to the arch. So the bloke said, oh, look at this or something. I said, well, what are they doing now? And we knew that this was something. You could tell it by some sort of ship boat or something, you didn't know, the size of it, you know, really get me interested. I said, I wish we could go and have a look. So, Oh, no. That was into and um, Pat was interviewed by Ian Oxley, who's in the room today. So thank you, Ian. Okay. So before I finish, um, I had asked one of our older frogs if she'd be willing to say a few words about her experience about volunteering with us. She started volunteering with us last year. Um, she did her frog training um, in April this year. I think we did the training. Um, Unfortunately, she's been taken ill, so she couldn't come today, but she sent me what she wanted to read out, and it's amazing, so I thought I'd read it. I'm afraid I'm not sure I can do it justice, but I will give it a go. Um, from my observation, all frogs have a strong sense of curiosity about some or many aspects of the Thames. They also have the desire to be part of something worthwhile. Other frogs share those qualities, and speaking as one, I can say it's excellent to discover an organisation who wants to put that curiosity to good effect. It provides the structure, the training to acquire, and above all, an opportunity to use the skills learned on the skills course it runs. Of course, I'm talking about the foreshore recording and observation group, Frogs. The setting in which to use these skills is mind-blowing. The Thames foreshore. The Thames is such a magnificent river, wide, tidal, fast-flowing, and used. One of my earliest memories is being woken to a loud cacophony. I can't say that word, sorry, of noise. <laughs> It was midnight, New Year's Eve, and the sound was of the combined hooters of all the ships, boats and tugs on the Thames, which was several miles from the house I lived in. The Thames environs was a heavy-duty working area the whole length of the river. Only people with business to attend to went along streets by the river, and certainly strangers never went down to the foreshore. A lifetime later, now was my chance. Having signed up for the frog training course, theory, and then four practice days by the river, it was a long wait for the next course to start. The theory training was quick but thorough. The group was a complete mix of people, impossible to generalise about. This was a very good as far as I was concerned, because being with a group of individuals is energising. Their wide-ranging interests make you want to have several lives. Theory done, next we were on to the fieldwork practicals. It was a fine day, not too early in the morning. The introduction to the foreshore by the Mayflower steps could not have been better. I got down the mud-laden stairs, determined that my arrival on the foreshore was not a spectacular slide. <laughs> some people walked confidently over the slippery, rubbled foreshore, some didn't. As arms were offered and accepted, nobody fell. There was time to look about. Every time I leave the street level for the foreshore, I am impressed and delighted by the total change of environment. How very different the foreshore feels from the street level. Even the wind is different. The Thames itself looks different, swirling and eddying. It suddenly feels as elemental as standing on a mountain. The foreshore is exciting because it can tell us so much. The Thames itself is exciting is because it's dangerous, a force to be reckoned with. The first instruction I heard from each and every frog leader was, don't step backwards on the foreshore. I could see seen the sense of it. The foreshore is sneakily dangerous. Every section has different challenges. The barely noticeable 10 centimetres of iron rods sticking up, infill that could twist your ankle, the astonishingly high washes from river clipper boats speeding through the water. You soon learn to watch out for the tide turning, rapidly running up the foreshore. As an older frog, you quickly learn the type of foreshore you're most comfortable with. Like most people, I like a certain amount of danger, but I'm very realistic. It would be so embarrassing to be stretched off the foreshore. <laughs> It's fun mastering new skills when you have a purpose and excellent to have the environment and the setup to practice them in. Fortunately, most of the skills themselves aren't too taxing. It is the awkward positions you have to get into which can be the challenge. For example, scrubbing wooden beams. Nothing difficult there, but the kneeling, squatting, bending, stretching, avoiding being splattered with muddy water, filling and emptying the buckets. Believe me, some part of your body will tell you clearly when a move might be a good idea. The good news is that we can change task any time we like to to something else. 
But unless the aforesaid ache is too much to tolerate, often we would much rather stay because the banter and the chat between the team is great. The information that you pick up from these open discussions is riveting. It helps the theory get translated into practice. The level of knowledge frogs have about the history of life by the Thames is both wide ranging and down to earth. Believe me, time passes in a flash. Observing the foreshore is nothing like as straightforward as I had imagined. This is still a challenge to me. When monitoring, I see something, take a photo, look about me to see what I can locate with it. But that doesn't mean I can ever find it again, even 10 minutes later. Obviously, I'll have to arm myself with red paper flags because finding recorded stuff on the foreshore is for me like finding a snowball on a ski run. I will get better, I hope. The recording part of fieldwork most certainly needs practice. We thoroughly covered it in training, but for real, it's always different. I can't pretend that I have got it cracked yet. The final result on the graph paper can look somewhat out of kilter compared with object, the wooden post on the ground. This is where being part of a team comes into its own. The other frog team workers look at the object, the measurements, etc. There's a bit of discussion about wood, oak or elm, the indentations, do we record these, yes, how. It's all good stuff and an eye-opener for me. The recording gets sorted to everyone's satisfaction. We move on to the next upright object. Is it in line with the next piece? It's so valuable picking up the tricks of the trade by watching those with more experience than you. Getting the hang of the knowledge feels so good. Job done. You can feel the buzz of satisfaction going around the group. It's clear to us all that the Thames and its foreshore is constantly changing. I've watched a huge beam wash free of the foreshore to float down the Thames. Layer upon layer of history of life by the Thames. How daunting was that? There is recording to be done and frogs are doing it. All interested, willing hands, observing, recording. It's rewarding. Of course older people enjoy it. Who wouldn't?